All right, welcome back. For this video, I want to talk about the YouTube video that I posted that was a summary of this this old opera, uh, Madam Butterfly. Um, so this this can get confusing. So we, we we need to get this straight right from the beginning. The play that that we are reading that I'm going to have you write this essay about that that we're going to be talking about for the next number of weeks that is called M Butterfly. Right? It was written in the '80s. David Henry Huang is the author. Now, it, 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 it is kind of connected in a way, like it's, it's kind of a takeoff or spoof, it's kind of making fun of and dealing with this much older opera, which is, you know, a kind of play, I guess, uh, in that it performs like a, a play, but operas have a lot more singing, obviously. Um, but in 1904, um, there's this opera written called Madam Butterfly by um, Giacomo Puccini, so that, that was written in 1904, Madam Butterfly, 1988, I think, uh, M Butterfly. So we need to maintain that these are two separate things, right? One play, Madam Butterfly, uh, the play we're focusing on, M period Butterfly. Um, so we've got to make sure that we have this straight, okay? Uh, when you start reading M Butterfly, you'll see that it kind of explains the plot of Madam Butterfly and it tells us that um, the main character of M. Butterfly, uh, that his favorite play uh, or favorite opera is Madame Butterfly. So th there's kind of an intimate connection between this old opera, Madame Butterfly, and the play we're reading, M. Butterfly. Okay? So this video that I had you watch, it was a summary of Madame Butterfly, not M. Butterfly, but Madame Butterfly, again, the old opera, 1904. Um, so th 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 that video, it's, it's a little, you know, it's, it's kind of stupid. It's a little bit lame, I guess. Um, like, they're trying too hard to be funny. But I, I do think it does a good job of, you know, conveying the basic facts of the opera and uh, in a way that's understandable and, you know, relatively quick. So I, I just wanted to, to, you know, give us this background as we start reading M. Butterfly. <clears throat> so um, as it tells us in that video, the story of Madame Butterfly is uh, a, a U.S. Army soldier um, or naval officer, whatever, uh, this guy Pinkerton, he uh, is stationed in Japan. Uh, and, you know, while he's there, uh, he basically takes advantage of, you know, these weird local laws and uh, pretty much, like, buys um, this teenage girl to be, like, his wife. Um, I think it's, it's like, I, I think she might have been like a, like a geisha or, or whatever, but, you know, he buys, he buys her for like, uh, you know, incredibly small amount of money and then marries her, uh, knowing that he is eventually just going to leave and go back to America and just leave this woman. So he's just taking advantage of woman, this teenage girl, really. Um, so he's really just taking advantage of her, uh, and, you know, kind of ruining her life also, um, just because whatever he like wants to have sex with her, I guess. Uh, so yeah, it's this terrible story, right? So then, so eventually he leaves. He does go back to America once his like tour is over. Uh, Butterfly, um, I think, becomes pregnant before he leaves. Uh, so while he's gone, she you know has uh, his child and is like waiting for him to come back, right? He told her he was going to come back, even though he really didn't plan on it. Um, so she has this kid, she's like waiting for him to come back and talks about, you know, every time a, a U.S. ship comes into Japan, she thinks it's going to be him and, and all this stuff. So it's just, you know, this terrible uh, situation of her like waiting like that. Um, I think eventually he finds out that there, that um, she had a kid, but he like sends um, his friend, uh, uh, Sharpless, who, who is, is like the good guy here, right? He's like, hey, Pinkerton, you kind of suck. Like you're doing a bunch of bad stuff. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do this. Uh, Pinkerton does it anyway. He eventually sends Sharpless and his wife to go and get the baby. So his American wife goes over to Japan, takes the kid back to America, um, and then Butterfly, uh, again, this this Japanese teenager, is is you know left to herself now. The baby has been taken, and yeah, she um, commits suicide, and that's how the opera ends. You know, so it's definitely playing on these stereotypes or including these stereotypes of, you know, um, like, 
that, that are associated with like Japan and like Asia generally, but I think Japan specifically of like honor and all this stuff. And, you know, she was dishonored. So she has to kill herself. Um, you know, and it specifically, uh, uh, marks it as like, uh, uh, seppuku, which is, yeah, this like traditional, like honor suicide, uh, thing. So, so that's the story. So I, I think when, when we hear it this way, we're like, oh, this is a terrible story, right? This is kind of awful, you know? And I think when, I, when we uh, hear it explained this way, there's even maybe a way where we could see it as being critical of America or of Pinkerton and, and you know, the way that, that he, he treated this, you know, because we hear this story and our sympathy is with, uh, you know, Butterfly and not with Pinkerton. But I really don't think that's how it was understood at the time. So we'll see in M. Butterfly, when the main character, he talks about how this is such a beautiful story. And I think that's how people perceived it at the time, you know, because it's an opera um, and it was supposed to be, I guess, like, like a tragic ending or something, but it was also supposed to be like beautiful, you know? Um, like, I, I think the, the guy in, in M. Butterfly, our main character, he says, you know, well, it, it was a pure sacrifice, her killing herself at the end. She just loved him so much or whatever. So I think that that's what we have to understand is that this play, so it was written by an Italian guy in 1904, right? So it wasn't really interested in getting the portrayals of, of um, you know, of, of Asian people uh, correct, of uh, Japanese uh, culture correct. Um, it was just more, yeah, trying to tell whatever, like this beautiful, tragic love story. Um <laughs> so it's, it's hard to, you know, see it that way from our perspective, but I think that is how people understood it at the time. Uh, they, they thought it was like a beautiful thing that she kills herself at the end. It's a pure sacrifice or whatever. So I, I think the, the, this, you know, and I think part of what M. Butterfly is trying to do, and, and uh, what I would say is that uh, Madame Butterfly is, a, you know, pretty, has some bad messages, I guess we could say. I, I think it... Uh, definitely leans into all of the stereotypes of, about, uh, uh, you know, Asia generally and Japan specifically. Uh, and it's, yeah, just, I think doesn't really question the kind of colonial relationship there. So part of the stuff that was going on during this time, 1904, when this is written, is kind of what, what, when you really started to see China and, and Japan and, and the whole East really be like, more opened up to like foreign trade and stuff. If you remember learning in history class about this thing called the open door policy, um, this was an attempt by, you know, England and America and, and other European countries to open up China and Japan and, and all the other um, Asian countries as well, but, but mo mostly China, I think, uh, to open them up for trade, right? So I, I, th I think like, I think Europeans for a long time had, had wanted to uh, have better like business relationships and basically be able to make money off of um, you know uh, Asia, Asian countries. So uh, this is when a lot of this stuff is happening. You also have the Spanish American War, which I think ends in 1898. So that's you know six years before this play is written, and that's when um, as a result of the Spanish American War, the United States took possession of the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines became the Philippines became an American colony uh, right at the beginning of the 1900s. So I think this is really a time where, where you saw like colonialism and European influence trying to work its way into um, Asia and like specifically China and Japan. So I, I think that's kind of some of the stuff that's going on in the background here too. Like like why is there um, you know an American naval officer in Japan to begin with? Uh, like how Madame Butterfly starts. And it's, it's, yeah, because America is, is trying to spread its empire all over the world. You know, America didn't fight a war with Japan in 1900. Um, they eventually fight them in World War II, I guess, but it's 40 years later, so that hasn't happened. So even the fact that Pinkerton would be in Japan to be in this position as a naval officer uh, just kind of shows us, like, the historical and, like, geopolitical stuff going on here, how colonialism is involved. And, and his position where, where, you know, he comes to Japan as a soldier and his immediate first thing he wants to do is, like, take advantage of, of these, like, messed up local laws that allow him to, to just, like, buy this, this teenage girl to be his wife or whatever. Um, so the, the whole thing, I think, we have to see is connected um, to the attempt by Americans and Europeans to gain control over the East. Uh, 
and and yeah, the American colonial efforts in places like the Philippines and and stuff like that. So I, I think that the point of view of M. Butterfly, and I think for most of us, is that Madame Butterfly is, yeah, just kind of a, a, a whatever, if, if people like it aesthetically. I mean, I don't think the music's that good. I've listened to the music. I don't think that's good. But that the messages that come out of it are terrible, that, that they're basically just reinforcing stereotypes about Asian people and um, showing a kind of, you know, embrace of, of American colonialism and, and the idea that Americans, uh, whatever, should be able to go into the, the East and do whatever they want. We'll see how this happens more. But really, I just wanted to give us kind of some background knowledge about this old play, Madam Butterfly, and how it had, you know, these messages about stereotypes and colonialism and stuff. Because I think that's kind of a starting point for M. Butterfly. Uh, everything that you really need to know about Madam Butterfly gets explained in M. Butterfly. Um, the main character of M. Butterfly will talk about how, how you know, he always loved that, that old opera and he thought it was so beautiful and, and he wanted to be Pinkerton, right? So one of the things that, that I'm going to want to be looking at as, as we talk about Act 1 of the play next week, Act 1 of M. Butterfly next week, is, like, how this old opera, Madame Butterfly, influences the characters in M. Butterfly. And more generally, just kind of, like, the role that art can play and, and how it can... Um, like, create expectations in us about, like, what the world's supposed to be like or how it can kind of, like, shape our perception of the things that are happening to us uh, based on what we've seen in, in, you know, for us, probably movies, but for them, operas, uh, for, for, you know, these old people. Um, so, yeah, let's just keep that in mind, that Madame Butterfly, just, again, kind of this, this pro-colonialism, kind of racist uh, opera that tells, you know, this, just this awful story. Um, so we'll see as we talk about M. Butterfly how uh, Madame Butterfly is going to show up in there. But even just from the title, you can tell that M. Butterfly was interested in this old opera, Madame Butterfly. So we're going to have to see what the connections are there and how it plays out. But yeah, I just wanted to give us kind of that, that background knowledge as we start to read M. Butterfly. Okay, see you later.